Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. So it's my pleasure to introduce, uh, I'm not Clement Sanchez, but it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Luis uh, Lismarzan for uh, your second lecture. So today, I guess it will be about uh, colloidal synthesis, a topic that is extremely interesting, at least for us, that we do synthetic chemistry and nanomaterials. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marco. So if we can recover the signal, Anyway, um, no, 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 this one, this one is okay. Okay, thank you for coming back. Um, I hope uh, you will find this interesting enough, so I will keep your attention also in the coming lectures. As uh, Marco was saying today, I'm going to talk mainly about nanoparticle growth. There will be a little bit of assembly at the end if I have time. If I go too long, just let me know and I will stop. Okay, so a little bit of general introduction. Uh, those of you who are familiar with colloid chemistry have already probably seen this graph or a similar one uh, many times, which is related to some of the mechanisms that can be involved during the growth of particles in dispersion. Typically, you start from soluble precursors of the solid material that you want to precipitate. And then uh, there will be the so-called uh, solubility limit and the nucleation threshold at different concentrations of the soluble material. And so uh, the theory of nucleation and growth that was originally formulated by Lamer and Dinegar already 70 years ago, says that uh, in order to uh, nucleate or to obtain the formation of crystals in, from solution, you have to go well above the solubility limit even above the nucleation threshold, so that ideally you're creating a lot of nuclei very quickly. And because you're already spending quite a lot of the original precursor into making the nuclei, then the concentration will also decrease very quickly. And so the rest of the material, will, which is above the solubility limit, will be deposited on the nuclei that you have created at the, at the initial stage. And so if this works well, then you will follow this path so that all the particles at the end will be of the same size. And uh, to find the conditions for that is not always so straightforward, but it works for some of the most uh, popular syntheses, for example, in silicon oxide, in polystyrene, and a few other materials. Of course, there are risks that things go wrong. So for example, if the nucleation is not so fast, then you can continue to have nucleation for a longer time, meaning that you're creating nuclei during all this time. And so there will be some that grow larger than others because they have been in dispersion for a longer period of time. There may be also processes at which some of the small particles initially aggregate and form larger particles by aggregation. And so there are a few different mechanisms that can be involved typically in this type of uh, colloidal synthesis. Now, one of the most typical uh, processes to make gold colloids is the very well-known uh, citrate reduction method, which was initially developed by Turkovich and colleagues in the 1960s or late 50s. And it is uh, actually a very simple one. I used to use it as a demonstration uh, for the students at the lab. Uh, even, uh, I don't know if I mentioned this uh, last week, but this was one of the reasons that I started looking at uh, the metal colloids. Uh, there was this guy coming to the room to explain how pregnancy tests work. And he had a bowl like this directly on the table. And he was heating and stirring while explaining the market and the functioning of the tests. 
And then at some point he was coming and adding a second solution. So the color was starting to change after a few minutes from very dark into uh, purple and then finally deep red. And so the final stage would look something like this where it looks, you know, bright red. But if you irradiate with a laser pointer, you will be that the laser is visible through the liquid, meaning that you have light scattering. So there are particles floating around. If, the, if, there was, if this was a homogeneous solution, you should not see the laser path through the liquid. OK, so the particles that you typically obtain at the end of this process look like this. Really relatively uniform, typically sizes around 12 nanometers. Depending on the conditions, you can go up to maybe 30 max. Until if you force the conditions a bit more, you can increase the particle size, but then you don't obtain spherical particles anymore. Uh, and now there are methods by which you can obtain gradually larger particles by continuing a process like this, but gradually adding the precursors, not having everything in the same pot at the beginning. But anyway, I wanted to comment how or what is the origin of those different colors that you saw in the first movie. So the, if you take a sample when the solution looks black, you would find something like this. Particles which are significantly larger than the ones that you obtained at the end, which is completely counterintuitive and seems to go completely against the graph that I showed you in the previous slide. So we and a few other people have been looking at uh, this process in more detail. And what we found was that if you take samples at further stages between the, oops, sorry about that. I don't know what I pressed. Between the, the dark uh, solution and the bright red, it says, oh, there's this, uh, this a joystick in the middle that I didn't recognize. OK, sorry about this. So at intermediate stages, you find something like this. So the clusters that initially were rather large, up to 100 nanometers, this is very sensitive. Eh? <laughs> and I don't even know how to make it, how to control it. Well, sorry about this. Maybe. Maybe I will use this one. That makes it easier. OK, so at intermediate stages, you have aggregates which are gradually getting smaller. It looks like these intermediate aggregates contain individual units that are getting gradually larger. So even though the total aggregate is smaller than this one, the units inside are getting bigger. And then at the end, you see some you know, better defined aggregates, which finally separate completely into individual particles. And the reason for this is mainly that here you don't really have well-defined gold crystals. You have complexes between gold and different uh, oxidation states of, this, of the citrate ions, which form these sort of larger complexes with little crystals in between. And then the gradual growth is taking place within the aggregates. And finally, there is citrate around the crystals that are growing, so that by electrostatic interactions will separate and form the stable dispersion at the end. So quite unusual, and uh, still you can still find recent papers dealing with the full discussion of this mechanism. OK, so we can make particles which are, look spherical. I showed you the other day also rod-like particles. And there are many different shapes that can be obtained by starting basically from the same precursors by changing the reaction conditions, and usually by adding some other uh, chemicals which may modify the way these crystals grow. But remember, when I showed you last week the high-resolution TEM of the particles from Faraday, uh, 
we saw that all the particles are still face center cubic, so exactly the same crystalline lattice as the bulk metal, and the same applies to all of these morphologies that you see here. There may be defects, but the crystalline lattice is always exactly the same as in the bulk, which is extremely intriguing, and this is why I have spent already 30 years working on under, trying to understand how this works. Okay, so let's uh, start from the very basic concept. So going back to that nucleation and growth that I showed you, in some cases you can tune by simply changing the concentration of the precursor in the original solution. Uh, Catherine Murphy in the early 1990s came up with the idea of separating nucleation and growth. So it's similar to what I, just, what I just told you. You can increase the size of spheres by adding more precursors so that slowly gold is being reduced on top of the particles that are already in the solution. This is exactly the same concept, but trying to induce an isotropy during the, the second growth. And so the idea is you first use a strong reducing agent. Again, the joystick, I didn't do anything. Um, you, you use a strong reducing agent like sodium borohydride, very well known for organic chemists. And then uh, you quickly form very tiny particles, which actually the quality here is not good enough. But uh, trust me, in the places where you see these lines, there, is, there are little crystals, which are single crystallines. And they are formed by this very quick reduction and stabilization with a surfactant which typically is this cetyl trimethyl ammonium bromide that I'll show you in a minute. And so you have this uh, dispersion of very tiny particles, typically one to three nanometers maximum, which are stable for some time. If you leave them uh, in solution for, say, one day, you will have much larger particles tomorrow. So you have to use them rather quickly. And then uh, you simply mix this dispersion with what we call the growth solution, which is a mixture of, again, gold chloride, same surfactant, and then a weak reducing agent. And I didn't write it here. I don't know why. But in the an, next slide similar to this, you will see that for this particular process, the one you see here, we also add a little bit of silver nitrate. And I could tell you the whole history of the thing, but then I would never finish. Uh, so this is all described in the literature why we are using silver. Not so well how the silver works, but I will try to give you some possible ideas also during the lecture. And so by doing this, you obtain very uniform dispersions of almost pure dispersions of nanorods. So very few spheres if you th do things properly. And uh, because we are using this surfactant, I, I think, I, well, I, I'm, I may be mixing up lectures because I, will, I have been giving lectures in other places be, between the last, last week and this one. But uh, anyway, uh, we are using this surfactant, which attaches to the gold surface through the quaternary ammonium head group, which has more affinity chemically. And then if you uh, look at this, then this should be on the surface of the nanorod, and then you would have a completely hydrophobic tail that would make the particles, you would think, stable in organic non-polar solvents. However, these dispersions are perfectly stable in water, meaning that there should be a combination of surfactants which are absorbed on the, first, on the surface or interdigitating with the hydrophobic tails, so that then you have also positively charged uh, groups which are facing the aqueous solution and providing a so-called electric double layer, which will lead to colloidal stability based on electrostatic interactions. OK, now, how does this process work? Well, that has been under discussion for many years. In fact, uh, Murphy came up initially with this idea uh, that because this surfactant can form uh, cylindrical micelles in solution, it may act as a sort of template that would favor the growth in one direction because as soon as the particles are getting longer, these micelles would wrap and protect the growth in other directions. 
Uh, this is not really making a lot of sense because the concentrations of surfactant that we are using are very well below the concentration that you need to create these cylindrical micelles. Okay? Then uh, we did some work together with uh, Paul Mulvaney, good friend in Australia, University of Melbourne, and together with a couple of theorists also in Melbourne. And the discussion was, typically what you need to reduce gold chloride on the surface of a growing particle is you have a complex between the gold chloride, which typically has first been reduced from gold-3 to gold-1 by the ascorbic acid. And then this is complex to the surfactant, which comes as a sort of micelle with adsorbed gold chloride ions. And then this comes to the part which is easier to reach. So you, you imagine the particle in solution floating around, and this micelle is also floating around and coming where the interactions with the growing particle will be more favorable. And so the discussion was, if you calculate the decay of the electric potential from the surface of an, an isotropic crystal, it will decay faster from the areas with the larger curvature than in the areas with the lower curvature. And this is why these micelles would come to the tips and continue growing in an elongated fashion. Question is, why do you get symmetry breaking in the first place? And this may be uh, a random process, or maybe this is not happening exactly like this. Uh, a crucial piece of information came a few years later, actually the following year, from the group of Philippe Guyossi Onest in Chicago. Uh, Philippe is doing a lot of different things, but he has a few seminal papers on this process which have been extremely influential. And in this one, he was the first to realize that depending what is the stabilizer that you use during the formation of the seeds, you can obtain different types of nanorods. Meaning that if you are reducing the gold chloride in the presence of CTAB, you would obtain consistently single crystalline seeds, very tiny. If you are stabilizing with citrate, you would obtain these particles, which are a little bit bigger, but in particular, they have crystalline defects. They have twin planes, so they are penta, pentagonally twinned. And then if you are applying these different seeds to the growth process, you would obtain either single crystalline nanorods, like the ones I showed you before, or pentagonally twinned elongated particles, which can be either by pyramids or nanorods. But they maintain a pentagonal cross-section. Okay? So this is very important because this already immediately gives you a handle how to control the anisotropy. Now, in this more recent paper, we discussed what we need in order to really understand the growth mechanisms and in order to try to be predictive. So saying, I oh, want to obtain this morphology, what should I do? And uh, the main conclusion was, we first need to know very well the crystalline habit of the particles that will be growing, so that you understand not only the defects, but also the surface energies of the facets. And uh, second, you need theoretical models which take into account most of the parameters that you are using in solution. And this is extremely complicated because there are many parameters, both thermodynamic and kinetic. And this is very difficult to combine in a single theory. But I think we should go that direction. And the final one was we need good characterization tools so that we can watch the particles grow with sufficient resolution. And there are already techniques that allow you to monitor the growth of particles in liquid inside a transmission electron microscope, but they still have some issues. For example, that the electron beam will also affect the process because you're injecting electrons. So you can imagine that you're promoting reduction already with the electron beam, and a few other things. But there are many 
advances, both uh, working in liquid or with advanced characterization tools that really help understanding some of these processes. And an example that we did actually before writing this paper was, I will go back just a second. So if you look at this picture here, this was like the initial assignment of the morphology of single crystalline nanorods. And this was done uh, mainly by Mustafa El Sayed and John Lin Wang, 1999, I think it was. And so they, assigned, they used electron diffraction to assign the lateral facets of the nanorods laying on a TEM grid, and they said, the tips may contain 111 facets, but the sides are a combination of alternating 100 and 110 facets. Okay. Now, coincidentally, we were doing some work where we found a way to obtain standing arrays of gold nanorods. And so we were able to obtain these arrays on TEM grids meaning that what you see here are not spheres. These are the cross sections of nanorods which are looking at you through the tip, okay? And this you see because these two other pictures are exactly the same area just by tilting a little bit the TEM grid. So you see that the particles are getting elongated because they are nanorods. Now, if you do this properly with much care, you can actually align the electron beam with the crystalline lattice of the particle in a way that you obtain high resolution through the cross section of the entire nanorod. And then you can assign facets based on the Fourier transform of this lattice, and also you can measure very carefully the angles between the different facets. And by doing that, what we found is that in most cases, the majority facets are this high index 250. Uh, and actually, there was an almost simultaneous paper by my friend Paul Mulvaney, published in Nanoletters, where they assigned to 1250, which is a very similar type of facet. And uh, this was very coincidental, because in 2010, August, I was visiting Paul uh, in Melbourne, and I, I came to him and said, Paul, you wouldn't believe it. We found these facets, and they are not what was claimed before. And he said, we know. And so we were ex working on exactly the same paper at the same time without knowing. Anyway, uh, a bit later than that, we started working with our uh, very highly respected and very fruitful collaboration Professor Sarah Balz at uh, the University of Antwerp. And uh, the, one of the first pieces of work that we did together was actually trying to demonstrate this uh, in more detail. And so they did atomic resolution electron tomography on a few of our nanorods. And they indeed found that you can assign the 520 or 250 facets by basically looking at the position of every atom and reconstructing the morphology of the nanorods. So if you are now look at the morphology, one, some, one thing that is actually supporting this claim is that the size of these facets is almost identical. If you had a combination of 110, 100, they could never be identical in dimension, okay? So this is important uh, because the reactivity of the different facets is also different. Now, another interesting experiment already a long time ago was the reverse process. And this was something that also we found a bit coincidentally, that if you have gold particles in solution, and then you mix them with gold chloride in the presence of CTAB, then what happens is that you are uh, disproportionating, or oh, sorry, comproportionating the gold zero and the gold three into gold one, meaning that you are gradually oxidating the particles. And so if you start from nanorods which are more elongated, you gradually see a blue shift in the position of the longitudinal plasmon, meaning that the rods are becoming shorter. And this you see also in this table here. 
And this is also quite interesting because it means that, again, the micelles that are transporting the gold 3 to the gold 0 particles are coming selectively through the tips. And so does this depend on the coverage of the surfactant on the rod? Does, this, does it depend on the decay of the electric potential? Does it depend on the reactivity of the different facets? This is something that we don't know exactly. Um, so we also did some attempts to uh, use theory to explain at least the final morphology that we have. And so this we did in collaboration with uh, Professor Nuria Lopez at the SIC in Tarragona. And Nuria is an expert in doing uh, DFT, density functional theory calculations of surface energies. And so she calculated the different facets, uh, some different facets of, of the gold lattice, uh, the FCC, uh, both naked and covered with different halide and halogens. And so uh, they found that if you look at the neutral halogen, there are very, very little differences between the uh, facets with the, the, pure, the neutral halogen absorbed on the surface. But if you look at the halides, at the ions, then there are huge differences between the different facets, uh, sorry, between the different ions. Uh, so chloride, for example, is absorbing much weaker than bromide, which is almost neutral, and iodine is, work, is absorbing much more strongly to the metal surface. Uh, second, you see here that looking at the ions, it's quite interesting that for all three halides, the lower, the more negative binding energy corresponds to the 5 to 0 facets. And so with this, you can start looking at what happens in 3D. And so uh, we start typically by this model seed, which is a cuboctahedron, which is the typical morphology of the single crystalline seeds. And then we also took into account this information from this paper from uh, Olivier Spala in CAA, who claimed that actually when you have the silver ions in solution together with the CTAB, they form a complex. And this complex is the one that will absorb on the surface of your nanoparticles to influence how the particles grow. And then if you look at this model, you see that if these silver ions are absorbing on the 111 facets, then they actually block this direction. And so you can have direction uh, growth only on the facets that are available for the gold ions to come and be reduced. And so by, again, doing the calculation of the surface energies in different steps of the absorption of the silver CTAB complexes and the approach of the gold ions to the surface, what you find is that the 5 to 0 are the facets that are decreasing energy continuously. And so if you do then the Wolf reconstruction of these facets, you find something which is very similar to the experimentally determined morphology of the particles. Now, you can criticize a lot this model because there are lots of simplifications here. We don't take into account all of the chemicals that are present. We don't take into account the kinetic effects. For example, if you change the concentration of the reducing agent of the ascorbic acid, then this process may be different because the kinetics will also influence. Okay? But it gives an idea that you can start reasoning based on theoretical models. Now, I will switch for a minute to a different morphology just to show you how a very tiny change in one of the reactants may also lead to a strong change in the morphology. So this is a process that was described by the group of Chad Merkin in 2012, uh, which uh, said that if you start from the typical seeds and then you dilute them, and then you add, uh, you, you reduce, you add gold 1 uh, from the reduction of gold 3, and then you add a little bit of potassium iodide together, together with the surfactant carrying the chloride, not the bromide. And then you add more gold ions and then uh, with ascorbic acid, then you are growing gold triangles. This works, but the population of triangles is very, very low. Now, my 
student Leonardo Scarabelli, who was one of the first that I had in San Sebastian, was trying to reproduce this process and found that if you do this addition much faster than was described in the original paper, suddenly it looks like the process works more efficiently and you get a larger population of gold triangles. Let me try to help you see where they are. So here, for example, we painted triangles in red and other shapes in blue. And we, ca we counted that about 50% now are nanotriangles coming out from the synthesis. Uh, if we look in the scanning electron microscope, we actually see that they have this thick cross section, which uh, seems to be also a little bit angled. And this can also be observed when you look in the electron tomography. So you see the, the lateral facets are all very flat, but on the sides they actually form a sort of angle, which also uh, indicates that in between the two facets, there is also a twin plane which is parallel to them in the middle. Anyway, if you now purify this process by using depletion interactions, uh, just as a reminder, these are some of the most popular uh, um, colloidal interactions that you may have. So I already mentioned electrostatic based on the overlap of the electric double layers. There is, of course, the steric when you have hydrophobic particles in an organic solvent so that the stabilizing ligands will avoid the collision between the particles. And this is one which is actually a, a bit more difficult to understand. So this is based on entropic interactions when you have a large population of small particles in contact with a smaller population of larger ones. And the concept is that if these particles are getting, the big ones are getting close to each other, they are excluding a volume to the penetration of the small ones, meaning that entropy will uh, be reduced. And since we want entropy to increase, the system brings the particle closer to each other so that the excluded volume is as small as possible. So it is an attractive force. And it works mainly for larger particles and it works also mainly if you have flat surfaces. And so by adding simply an, a larger concentration of the surfactant and forming a lot of micelles in the dispersion, you can go from this type of dispersion to the, oh sorry, this is the supernatant, and this is what would precipitate induced by these depletion interactions. So as you can see here, this is done by adding this CETA 25% in water, and then flocculation for one and a half day, and then you will have a full separation between the different shapes. And by doing that, then you can obtain pictures like this, which looks very much the same as the previous one, but if now I paint again the triangles, you see that almost 90% are already triangles. So this is efficient. It's a little bit cumbersome. You have plenty of synthetic steps plus the purification steps. So, you know, this is for you to take up and uh, maybe find a way to improve the efficiency for this process. As I will show you in a minute, we have done for the gold nanorods and by pyramids. Okay, uh, yes, yeah, so this is another evidence of the monodispersity. So this is the size distribution. And here you see the, the band, the plasmon band of the nanotriangles becomes even narrower than the one that we get for nanorods. And we can increase the particle size by changing the ratio between the growth solution and the initial seeds. And this also leads to a shift in the position of the plasma resonance. Okay, so back to nanorods, but now I will focus on the pentagonally twinned. And you remember this was made by using pentatwin seeds, stabilized initially by citrate, and then growing by adding more gold chloride, ascorbic acid, and depending what morphology you, you want to make, uh, you can also have some other additives. Anyway, uh, for a long time, the yields in these processes was similar to what I showed you for the triangles, right? 
And, uh, and actually two of these papers are ours. Uh, for some time they were, the, I think, the world record in terms of yields, uh, but still rather low. And then uh, there was this by pyramids from, again, Philippe Guyossi Onest, uh, who reported about 50% yield. Uh, in this uh, 2004 paper, we were showing pictures like this, very convincing that we obtained a very high density of nanorods, but actually, yes, we were honest and showed the full image with almost the same amount of spheres. And so, of course, you can also purify. So now you can come, this was shown by Nikhil Jana uh, after leaving the lab of Kathy Murphy. He actually was one of the first to use the depletion interactions to purify anisotropic uh, metal colloids. And then he could obtain dispersions of particles like this, rather elongated gold wires. So this was the spectrum before separation, meaning that spheres were dominating and you had a wide dispersion of nanorods. After separation by the depletion interactions, you get a much lower relative intensity for spheres and a much better defined absorption for the wires. Okay, so again, you are free to do this if you like. A few years ago, uh, my long-term technician, uh, technician Ana Sanchez Iglesias found this paper by our colleagues in Lyon, who were describing a process by which by using a combination of surfactants to make the initial gold seeds, it was possible to incubate them and then increase largely the concentration of pentatwined seeds in the original dispersion. And this is still rather intriguing because we are, see here, we are incubating at 80 degrees. We start from particles that absorb like this, or so very small ones. And then after an hour and a half, we obtain a much better defined plasmon resonance, meaning that the particles are getting larger, about six nanometers in diameter. And uh, our colleagues in Antwerp could do this screening of uh, lattice defects by using dark field microscopy. And then they told us, now you have at least 80% which are pentagonally twinned. A few have a single twin, like this one here. And a small population are still single crystals. But this is already very good news, because if we have such a high concentration of pentagonally twinned, then we can probably also increase the yield of anisotropic pentatwin particles. And indeed, this is the case. So this uh, spectra that you see here are corresponding to the final stage of using the same conditions of growth on seeds that were incubated by different periods of time. And so you see, if you start from the ones that were not incubated, you obtain this not so nice looking spectrum, which indicates a mixture of shapes, not much anisotropy, and then as you increase the incubation time, you can obtain much better and much better defined plasmon resonances. So this is actually an example for bipyramids, okay? And this is why we are using silver nitrate and hydrogen, hydrochloric acid also in the formulation. And so these are, this is how the particles look like for the different spectra that you see here. So initially, lots of potatoes, then potatoes with a few bipyramids, and then the concentration of the pyramids is gradually increasing until you obtain really amazing pictures. And, uh, and here you only see a few, but look at this. And so this is what we see everywhere on the TM grid. And this was extremely impressive when I saw. And, and, and Anna is extremely good at doing synthesis, but had never obtained anything like this before. And now she can do it routinely. I have to warn you. The ripening process requires a little bit of optimization in every lab, I would say. So my former postdoc, Cyril Lamont, who is now uh, at Paris-Saclay, who was here last week but uh, couldn't come today, 
He told me he managed to reproduce it, but only after optimization of the incubation, okay? So after you manage to really get the right seed, then the formation of very well-defined by pyramids is very straightforward. And in fact, I don't have the pictures here, but you can also make different sizes just by playing with the relative concentrations. And you see there is not only a gradual redshift in the main plasmon resonance, for very large sizes, you start to see other modes appearing, which also indicate very high monodispersity. Remember what I told you about the silver wires last week? You can only see the high, the high order multiples if all the particles look the same in the dispersion. And the same thing can be done for nanorods. Simply now you don't add any uh, silver nitrate and adjust the concentrations. And then again, by playing in, in, in a single shot, you can obtain samples like this with these very well-defined plasma resonances. In this case, there are less higher order multiples because the morphology is different, okay? But uh, yes, so this, this is really, I think, the, the best example of uh, improvement by finding ways to play with the crystallinity of the seeds. So in the case of the nanotriangles, if you were able to obtain a very high yield of single twinned seeds, you can probably obtain a very high yield of the nanotriangles. Now, another advantage of using these seeds is they are bigger, so they are much more stable than the one, two nanometer seeds I mentioned earlier. So these you can actually store for a long time and then still use for synthesis. But also, you can coat them with a little bit of palladium. And why do you want to do that? You want to do that because palladium not only can be distinguished in uh, energy dispersion spectroscopy, X-ray spe energy dispersion spectroscopy in, in uh, electron microscopy, but also the electron density is significantly lower than that of gold. And so, if you look at the particles after the synthesis with these coated seeds, you can actually see where they are located in the final particle. And so in bipyramids, no surprise, they are always located at the interface between the twins in the middle of the particle. But in rods, very often we see that they are displaced from the center. And you may fall in the temptation to say that the growth rate in this direction is larger than in this direction. And this is probably the case, but it may also be because the deposition of palladium is not uniform enough, and then you can also have an, an effect there. But still, you look at uh, the very nice uh, reconstruction in 3D. So this is a, what they call multimode electron tomography, where you can do not only electron tomography, you can increase the contrast to see the twins, and then you can use uh, EDX to find the position of the central seed. So, uh, I may be wrong, but I think that these advances in electron microscopy will be extremely helpful to understand some of these mechanisms. In a more recent piece of work, Anna again uh, was able to find a way to minimize the amount of bromide that you need to grow uh, anisotropic particles. So it is general knowledge in the field that you can only obtain nanorods if you have bromide present in the solution. And we are not saying the opposite. We still need bromide, but you don't need to have all CTAB. Uh, and is there a good reason to avoid CTAB? Well, the reason is this. CTAB is not very soluble in water. And so at temperatures below 20, 25 degrees, it will become cloudy and finally form very nice crystals at the bottom of your uh, cuvette or vial. And so by simply changing the relative concentration between CTAB and CTAC, you can get transparent solutions even at eight degrees Celsius. And uh, if you do the growth, or the seeded growth of the particles and the conditions that usually lead to the pentatwin rods, but using only CTAC, then you obtain the growth of spheres. This was also known. If you use uh, 
concentration of CTAB of one millimolar uh, compared to, to uh, I think it is 25 millimolar of CTAC. There you are still obtaining a few spheres, but many are already becoming nanorods. If you increase to two millimolar, then basically you obtain again monodispersed nanorods in dispersion. And again, they, if you look in the electron tomography, you see the pentagonal cross section, the five twins. And uh, not only that, actually, by playing with temperature, you can play with, you can modulate the final aspect ratio of the particles with exactly the same conditions. Meaning that if you're starting from the, from the same number of seeds, but just by changing the growth temperature, the particles have to become either thicker and shorter or thinner and longer because you have the same amount of gold in every particle, right? And so this is a really nice way of modulating the aspect ratio without changing the reaction conditions except for the temperature. And it also tells you that kinetics is playing a very important role in the growth of these particles. Uh, so the, here, actually, these are two examples for two different concentrations of uh, the reducing agent, ascorbic acid. And you see for a lower concentration of the reducing agent, you can even go to very long nano, nano rods because the process is slower. With a larger concentration, you are restricted to a narrower range of aspect ratios because the ascorbic acid itself is increasing the reaction rate. And this is also what you see in these plots here. So these are kinetic traces for different concentrations and different temperatures. And you see that there is a combined effect of the reducing agent concentration and the, and the temperature of the solution. So one more parameter that you have to be careful about but that you can also use to tune the morphology of your particles. Okay, so I go back to the single crystalline nanorods. As I mentioned, we need to use now a little bit of silver nitrate. And already from the discussion before, you have a hint why it may be important to have the, the silver nitrate. Again, if you are doing things correctly, you should be able to obtain pictures like this. And uh, by changing the ratio or different parameters, you can also tune the dimensions and the, and the optical response. So this is the reference where you can follow all of the tricks that we know. And usually, people find it useful. So uh, feel free to have a look. Now, a little bit more on the effect of different parameters and the, and the growth of these particles. So, um, first of all, we have the bilayer. And I already spoke about this last week. And I briefly said uh, also at the start of the lecture. And I already mentioned last week that there were bulk measurements by the group of El Sayed. 20 years ago, saying that the results of infrared spectroscopy and thermal gravimetry agree with a double layer. In our own analysis, which was also from bulk samples, a combination of small angle X-ray scattering and small angle neutron scattering allowed us to measure separately the dimensions of the rods by fitting the SACS curves and the thickness of the surfactant by using sungs, doing index matching between the solvent and the metal, and then finding the, the, the average dimension of the shell, which comes out to be a little bit smaller than what you get for bilayers on thin films, uh, meaning that either uh, you have a um, larger degree of interpenetration between the tails, or you have incomplete uh, bilayers. Uh, so you can play around also with the composition of the surfactant. And this is what uh, Guillermo Gonzalez Rubio, another bright uh, student who is now a junior group leader in Germany at the University of Constance. He came up with the idea of using a simple co-surfactant, which is known to influence the rigidity of the layers formed by the CTAB. Uh, 
And so uh, he proposed, first of all, to use this combination in order to restrict the growth of the gold nanorods to very small sizes. And the reason is, first of all, there is a need to obtain high quality tiny gold nanorods, mainly if you remember, because they absorb a lot more than they scatter, so they can be very useful for applications, for example, in heating or in electron transfer processes. Uh, but also because if these particles are small enough, then you can use them as a seed to grow well-defined nanorods with tailored dimensions. And this is uh, quite nice because it means that first you can do the symmetry breaking step very carefully from the tiny seeds into small nanorods, and then you already have an isotropic seeds which would be easier to grow into larger nanorods. Uh, so this is a typical picture of the seeds that we can obtain. Uh, the thickness of these rods is uh, about seven nanometers, and then you can vary the length from the growth conditions. And then by using these ones as seeds, then you can tune the morphology very nicely. You obtain immediately very high monodispersities. The process is also more robust, meaning that it's more reproducible by using this technique. And if you don't trust me that these were the seeds that we used to grow these rods, we have also the movie showing you the position of the initial rod after putting a little bit of palladium on top of it. Okay. And molecular dynamic simulations tell us that when you combine N-decanol with CTAB, you obtain more rigid layers or bilayers on the 5 to 0 facets than, in, for example, in 111, which would also fit with an easier reduction on the 111 than in the 5 to 0. So you maintain the lateral facets and you keep growing on the tips. Uh, Another important point, well, so uh, I already told you about uh, this paper. We recently published another in similar lines for the synthesis of the nanotriangle. So this is basically an example of a protocol paper where, again, we not only discuss everything in very much detail, actually we also provided pictures and videos of the most uh, difficult steps and so on and so forth. But even if you follow all of this, you should also read this one. So small differences in the batch that you obtain from the vendor may lead to complete failure in the synthesis. And we have experienced this too many times. Uh, so for example, if you buy CTAB and it brings a small contamination of iodide, then you're probably lost because iodide will block the seeds and the growth will not be an isotropic anymore. And a few other things that may happen. So anyway, uh, this is an important tip and it's maybe one of the uh, hurdles on the way to commercialization of this sort of technologies, but we have to work on that. So also in this direction, to show you the robustness and reproducibility of the method with decanol, in the supporting information of this paper, which is uh, quite long, see this is figure S28, uh, we actually showed the synthesis under exactly the same conditions using water coming from a few continents. So uh, labs of friends who were shipping water over the ocean, uh, the eye water. Uh, because we know that if you change from one lab to another lab, the quality of water may also influence the synthesis. Even the pH of the water may influence the synthesis. And so by, doing, by using these vessels of water without changing anything, we were able to obtain this type of reproducibility, which I think is even remarkable for standard synthesis in the same lab. Okay. Now, something a bit more, a bit different. How much time do I have? Oh, it's uh, still, uh, still, okay. Okay, uh, so I will go a bit quickly if, so I can tell you also a bit about assembly. Uh, 
So this I already mentioned last week, finding uh, optical activity in metal particles and trying in particular to fabricate particles which have this structural anisotropy. Actually, yeah, I, I'm not showing today the slide on the work of Professor Nam, but I can tell you a little anecdote. Uh, this morning, I was in, my, uh, in the apartment that was uh, uh, given to me for this month uh, by the Collège de France, and in one shelf I found a pile of magazines, mainly the magazine of the Collège, but I was bracing and I saw there was a, uh, an issue of nature. I took it out, it was exactly the nature where the NAMS paper was published, where you can actually read my name as one of the referees. So I don't know if Clement has something to do with that, but uh, this was a, a, a very funny coincidence. Anyway, so let me tell you about our own way of making chiral particles. And the inspiration came initially from this paper where they demonstrate that by mixing CTAB with this type of chiral co-surfactant, it's called binol, then you can obtain at the right concentration you can obtain worm-like micelles in solution which have some helicity, so they actually display circular dichroism from the scattering of these objects. And so, again, Guillermo and another postdoc in the lab, Jesus Mosquera, came up with this idea that if we mix these worm-like micelles with our nanorods, we should be long enough, maybe there will be a wrapping of the micelles around the nanorods, forming a sort of helical array of the surfactant on top of the surface. And so, uh, well, it was actually after the synthesis, but anyway, it looks better if I say, then we asked our colleagues to do simulations. And so this is Luis McDowell from Complutense in Madrid. They simulated the formation of the micelles by using molecular dynamics. This is a sort of analysis showing the helicity of the micelles. And they also simulated the absorption of the micelles on a gold cylinder, which shows a sort of quasi-helical absorption, both for binol and for binamine. And binamine we like better because it contains amines, so we thought it will bind more strongly to the surface of the metal. And then the second hypothesis was, once we have this, maybe we can do seeded growth, and because part of the surface will be blocked by the micelles, they should grow, forming a helical particle. And of course, this is already an experimental image. We obtained, well, they obtained particles like this. So starting from these rods, as you see, completely uniform, by growing in the presence of binamine and CTAC, if you use CTAB, it doesn't work. Uh, and then uh, this uh, very nice electron tomography from our colleagues in Antwerp clearly shows that there is this sort of templated seeded growth. If you change the relative concentration between gold and the nanorods, you obtain the same thing, but longer mm, or longer grooves on the surface, and you can even make thicker ones. And this I find extremely remarkable. So with the experience that we have on making particles, we never expected anything like this. Because you have to think that these, the dimensions of these lines of metal are a few nanometers, and they are separated also by a few nanometers between each other. So they have to be extremely well-defined, and there has to be something in between that blocks the connection between them. So let me show you just some a bit more beautiful reconstructions. So if you look carefully, you will see that in some areas you see very well-defined tilt in the grooves, which indicates the sort of helical array that we were expecting. Uh, if you use spheres, you see something which is not so well-defined. But uh, in fact, this also shows some circular dichroism. Uh, so this I already showed you last week. By increasing the thickness of the grooves, you can switch the circular dichroism to the near infrared, which fits quite well with the theoretical model. And by using the different enantiomers of the cosurfactant, uh, 
you can also obtain the two enantiomers of the helical nanoparticles. Okay, so quickly I move to a little bit of self-assembly. And I will restrict myself to self-assembly in dispersion and uh, to using uh, this type of hydrophobic interactions among the whole family of interactions that you can use to promote not only assembly but actually reversible assembly between nanoparticles. So you see there are plenty of parameters that you can play with, for example, metal ions when you have surfactants that can form complexes, so you can link and divide. Uh, you can use temperature, for example, in the famous DNA self-assembly because you can promote the hybridization of the DNA strands or denaturation and then separation. Uh, light by switching these uh, aso uh, ligands, which can change conformation de depending on the irradiation redox processes, and so on and so forth. So, this is our system. We have hydrophobic gold particles coated with thiolated polystyrene, and usually we disperse them in tetrahydrofuran. They are very perfectly stable in solution, or in dispersion, I should say. And then if you dry them on a TEM grid, they form these beautiful 2D arrays uh, because of the hydrophobic interactions between them. By playing around with the molecular weight of the polystyrene, you can actually tune the separation between the particles after the deposition. So this is actually quite a nice system to work with. Now, what happens if you have these particles in THF and then you add slowly some water on top of it? So water is more or less miscible with THF, but much more polar. So what happens is that you start to screen these hydrophobic interactions, oh sorry, these uh, repulsions, and then uh, you obtain clusters that are gradually increasing in size with time. And so if you take samples at different times, you see smaller, larger, and very large clusters. Uh, it's actually quite interesting to see that they also look to be well organized when you dry them on the grid. But uh, if you look uh, now at these samples in electron tomography, you actually find that they are basically flat on the surface of this TEM grid, uh, which we don't believe happens in solution, right? So in dispersion, you don't expect them to be flat floating around. So in order to, well, first of all, uh, this is completely reversible. So you can have the particles in THF, add water, precipitate them completely, remove the solvent, add pure THF, and then they will redisperse again. But you can also think about protecting them by using the same uh, trick that has been used in several occasions to transfer hydrophobic particles into aqueous solution. So this means that you have the particle with the polystyrene ligands, and then you add a block copolymer, which has polystyrene on one block and polyacrylic acid on the other block. So you have one hydrophobic, which will interdigitate in between the polystyrene ligands on the surface. And then you have a hydrophilic block, which will stabilize your particles in water. And this works, you see here, the shell is very well defined around the particles. You can also use it for anisotropic particles and it works in every case. Now, will it work on the clusters? And uh, so this is the main point of what I'm going to show you. So if you are using this trick during the aggregation of your particles in dispersion, this was the plot I showed you earlier, but now you can add the block copolymer at different times and then it will be completely constant with time. And this is, this is quite nice because now you can also take the samples at different times and you see they have a completely different appearance to what I showed you before. First of all, they can be restricted to smaller sizes, but also the organization does not seem to be the same as I showed you earlier. So again, our friends in Antwerp did these beautiful electron tomography movies where you can see not only that they are, of course, organized in 3D, 
but also that even after drying them and taking them into the electron microscope in vacuum, they are perfectly separated from each other, meaning that the polystyrene is again interdigitating and preventing the collapse between the particles. Uh, you can also do the same thing. Oops. Sometimes this happens that uh, the weight, oops, sorry, now I went too fast. Maybe. So this is what uh, you find when you're using particles which were coated with polystyrene of different molecular weights. So again, like I showed you on the 2D, in 3D also the interparticle separation is defined by the length of the polystyrene chain. And the same as I showed you earlier, even when they are protected, you can also make this completely reversible. So you can transfer uh, from THF into water, and then you can uh, add more THF and disrupt it, and then pure THF, and they will redisperse into individual particles. The forces can be defined like this. So when you have the particles with polystyrene, you have one uh, repulsive component, which is the sort of hydrophobic forces. Uh, you have one attractive component from the van der Waals attraction, and then you have another hydrophobic com uh, repulsive component from the hydrophobic forces, which depends on the uh, dielectric constant of the solvent. Okay, uh, you can also try to do a model which is a bit more simple by using this simple uh, uh, interaction potential and then introducing it into a Monte Carlo modeling, uh, you can obtain a phase diagram with the organization of the particles into clusters of different sizes, depending on the attraction and the dimensions, the length of the protecting layer, and the dielectric constant. And then you can do the simulations, and now you tell me which ones are the simulated ones and which ones are the experimental uh, pictures. Right, so it's not so difficult because these ones are more spherical individually, right? But the, 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 the prediction is amazingly coinciding with you, what you obtain from the electron tomography. So this again gives you a sort of predictive power if you're able to manipulate these parameters that I mentioned, then you should be able also to define what type of cluster you're going to obtain. And again, as I showed you for single particles, this can be done for particles of different morphologies. These are drawings, but these are also experimental uh, electron tomography images from gold dumbbells and from gold nanostars together with magnetic nanoparticles combined. So no time to explain this. Let me just tell you one little piece of the story, which takes this type of materials a little bit farther and maybe uh, Cedric will like it better because I will have some porosity. Okay, so you know this part of the story, right? And now the idea that we had was now we are going to encapsulate it with a rigid capsule. So let's grow silica, but leaving pores so that we can extract the block copolymer. And then we have a sort of, how you call it, this game for kids, you know, you can make noises. Uh, so in fact, the funny thing would be that now you would have the walls of the silica, which would be hydrophilic, in contact with the ligands on the particles which are hydrophobic. And then you can play with the organization of the particles inside of the capsule when you're changing the solvent. So this is how the particles look like. So individual particles, the clusters capped with the block copolymer. And here, if you look carefully, you will see that there is another layer with some lines in between, not so easy to see here. Uh, maybe the next one. So here you see it better, right? So this is something that Cedric now can recognize. All right, so we have the system that we wanted. Uh, we can also do elemental analysis and everything fits well with what we expected. And now, these particles which are stable in uh, polar solvents, 
can be dispersed again in THF, and then you can remove the block copolymer because it is soluble, and it fits through the pores of the silica wall, but the particles don't. And so you start to see already that there are some changes in the spectrum with time. And if you look at the samples in the electron microscope, you see that the contrast is different before and after extracting the block copolymer. And also, the particles here are well organized because they cannot touch each other, but here they are only restricted by the polymer, which is actually even collapsed because it is in water. Uh, you can also look at changes in the color, and now it's much nicer than before because now the, uh, the clusters are always exactly the same. They cannot change because they are encapsulated by the silica shell. And so this is completely reversible, you see here. Okay, so simply changing the solvent with exactly the same particles, you find perfect reversibility in so many cycles. Uh, you can also watch uh, the particles and the different solvents. So basically by drying quickly the, the system from the organic solvent, they would expand again, and in water they would collapse again. And even you can play this trick reversibly by simply THF vapor. So you have the particles on a glass light, warm THF, they redisperse like this, and then you take them out, THF evaporates, and they become blue again because they organize inside of the capsules. So I don't know what this will be useful for. Maybe you can find, come out with an idea, but at least it's a concept that I think is quite interesting uh, as a general idea. So with this I finish. Again, thank you very much, and uh, I hope I will I convince you that to come back next week. I'll ha be happy to answer questions. <laughs>